All right, ladies and gentlemen, today is my lucky day because today I have a very special guest in my channel and his name is James Brahaji as many of you know him. So I will not speak much about him, let him introduce himself. So welcome to Exotic Astrology. I am very grateful that you have come here on such a short notice. So today he will be talking on uh, so many things on fundamentals, basics, and uh, he has uh, his uh, notes, which he will be speaking from his age old uh, Pandora's box, which he will be opening in front of all of us today. So I welcome you once again. And uh, he has written so many books about which he will be speaking here. And we can also uh, approach him for consultations. I think you also do consultations. Yes. So I will pin the description uh, uh, in the description, the uh, link to his website and his other details so that if somebody wants, they can contact him. All right. So uh, the stage is yours. So it's over okay. to you now. Yeah. Welcome. So uh, let me introduce myself. I, uh, this was my first book, Ancient Hindu Astrology for the Modern Western Astrologer. That was written in 1986. It came out in 1986. The next book was my autobiography. This was uh, about, this is called Astro Logos Revelations of a Hindu Astrologer. Okay. And that was, that was when I went to India. That's the story of going to India. And then I wrote some others. This is How to Be a Great Astrologer, which is more Western astrology. Okay, okay. Western aspects. This one here is how to predict your future. Wow. Which is this is the the Western transits and the Hindu dashas and bhuktis. Oh, okay. And my last Hindu astrology book is this one called The Art and Practice of Ancient Hindu Astrology. Okay. And this one is an important book because this one it was written after I was practicing for 20 years. Oh, okay. So when I wrote my first book, Ancient Hindu Astrology for the Modern Western Astrologer, I basically taught very traditionally and I taught how it was taught to me. But after 15 or 20 years, I, I found many things that worked really well and many things that didn't work at all. So that book is you know oriented towards what you should really use. And then uh, this is a book, Living Reality, which is about Advaita, okay. non-duality. Non That's a spiritual book. They can, they can read the, about these books on my website, jamesbraha.com. Yes, I'll pin it down in the description. Yes, okay. Yes. So today we can talk about some, I'm just going to give some points, some little issues in Jyotish, Hindu astrology, Vedic astrology. Things that sometimes get forgotten or things that are misunderstood. I, ha I am very picky when it comes to astrology. I'm very <laughs> picky about getting the, the significations of the houses, what they mean. Okay. The planets, the houses. Many people, they use this, they use that. They, yes. And I don't like that. I'm very specific. It doesn't mean I'm right all the time. Yeah. I try to be right all the time, but there will be different opinions. But if I tell you that this is how it is, then that means that's how I experience it. Okay. So just some, some points. Something that gets missed a lot in the horoscope is happiness. Happiness. So a person may have a horoscope with a great career. Yeah. They may have a horoscope with great money. Okay. They may have a car horoscope with a great spouse. Okay. But if the fourth house and Venus are both afflicted, they will never be happy. Okay. On the other hand, the person can have a weak career, little money, okay. <laughs> oh. no spouse, and if okay. the fourth house and Venus are good, the okay. people are happy. Okay. So this is so that's a very, very, very uh, you know simple thing. Um, another thing is when I'm looking for spiritual evolution. There are three major gods: Saturn, Mercury, Jupiter. Saturn is Lord Shiva. 
Mercury is Lord Vishnu, mm -hmm. Jupiter, Lord Brahma, Lord Krishna. So if Saturn, Shiva, is aspecting the sun or the moon, okay. the first house ruler or the first house, okay. then that's a person that's going to be Shivite, okay. meaning, meaning they gain their evolution through meditation, detachment from the world, oh, okay. detach, detachment from the senses. If Mercury is aspecting the ascendant, the sun, the moon, or the ascendant ruler, then they get their knowledge through Advaita, through the truth, information. The truth will set you free. Okay. That's Mercury. If Jupiter aspects any of those significations, then the person gets their evolution through devotion. Oh. Devotion. So if you go to the Hare Krishnas, okay. people that are always chanting Hare Krishna, yes. Jupiter, Jupiter will be aspecting those things. Oh, okay. If you go to the people where they're meditating and they're separate from the world, Saturn oh, is aspecting. Okay. So, of course, you may have all three. Oh, you may have okay. all three. But you have to see which one is aspecting the strongest. Okay. So if Saturn is aspecting the, if Saturn is 10 degrees and the ascendant is 8 degrees and it's aspecting, it's very strong. Oh. Jupiter could be aspecting the ascendant 25 degrees and the ascendant's three degrees. It's an aspect, but it's weak. So you have, so that's how that works. Uh, another thing in um, Hindu Vedic astrology is when a planet is not, it's not fallen, not, not Nietzsche, but opposite its own sign. Okay. It's, not so, it's not so good. This is not something that they talk about much in India. But if wow. Jupiter's in Gemini or Virgo, it's not so good. Okay. If Venus is in Aries or Scorpio, it's not so good because Venus rules the signs opposite yeah. Aries and Scorpio. Venus rules Taurus and Libra. So if it's an opposite sign, we call that here in America, we call that detriment. Another thing, planets in very late or very early degrees Yes. They are gener they are generally weak. They're generally weak. So when I get horoscopes of children that were adopted. Oh. Adopted. Okay. The the ascendant is usually zero degrees, twenty nine oh. degrees, one okay. degree, twenty eight. Very weak ascendants. Oh. The parent the child does not have enough charisma to attract the parent to keep the child. Oh, okay. Now, this does not mean that every chart with a weak degree ascendant will be adopted. But when, but when you find the charts of people that are adopted, watch how many of them have that. Oh. Now, now, of course, the ascendant could be 29 degrees or zero or one degree, but Venus or Jupiter or Mercury aspects the ascendant. Okay. Then you don't have to worry. Oh. And then you have strong aspect. You see... One of the biggest problems with the books, people read the books to learn astrology. I've written six books. You can never get all the information into the books that you need. You can't do it. So when people read the books, they read, if a planet is fallen, it's terrible. If it's exalted, it's wonderful. But this is just one little part of it. A planet could be exalted, but aspected by three malefics. Oh not going to be good or a planet could be weak but aspected by jupiter or venus within a degree or two okay so on my website it, it actually in that book in the in the book the art and practice of ancient hindu astrology in that book there is a section in there which gives a list it's called positive planetary priorities and there's a big long list of things that can make a planet strong or weak. Everybody knows strong or weak, but, but trying to get it in the order. You know, a planet may be in its own sign, but I would much prefer to have a planet aspected within one or two degrees of a great benefic. Okay. So now this is also on my website. You go to my website, jamesbraha.com. 
there is a uh, there's a little section on the left hand side by the uh, table of contents. It says read a chapter from my latest book, The Art and Practice of Ancient Hindu Astrology. Within that chapter, there's a whole page or two how to see what is most important for a planet and what is least important. This is critical. You know, when I started astrology, I would say to my astrologers, what is more important, the planet in the house or the planet ruling the house? Okay. Nobody can answer this. Yeah. They're both important. The planet ruling the house is the foundation. Yes. But the planet in the house is what's there. So it's like it's like somebody's home. Yeah. They could have they could have a beautiful home with golden toilets and chandeliers, but if the foundation of the house is being eaten away by termites, oh, yeah. it's good. Yes. Or it could be a very solid house. Foundation is strong. But inside the house is dirt and grime and mold, so it both yeah, have to be. That's considered. very true. That's very true. Hmm. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I use a lot that that very few people use is the great years of the planets. Okay. The great years of the planets. The, you know, my experience with astrology, I use what works in my own life. If, if I find something doesn't work, I don't use it. Okay. If it does work, then I use it. When I was in India and I was asking my second teacher about my career, he said, well, Saturn is your Raja Yoga Karaka. Saturn is the royal union maker. And Saturn rules your career, my career house. Saturn has its great year in the 36th year of life. Okay. So he said, you will not know your full career until the 36th year of life, which means the 36th year is between 35 and 36. Yes. Okay? Yes. That's when I wrote my first book, right around then. That's so something that I find quite often, that I find quite often is that people will get divorced or married or something highly significant the year the ascendant ruler comes of age, the year that the ascendant ruler has its great year. So the great years are in my books. I'll mention them here just in case. Jupiter is the 16th year of life. Mm -hmm. That means between 15 and 16. Yes. The sun is the 22nd year, between 21 and 22. The moon is the 24th year, between 23 and 24 is the 24th year. Venus is the 25th year. This is fascinating with Venus. Venus rules numbers, okay. numbers, math. And you will find that the Albert Einstein and the geniuses of math, they do their greatest work <laughs> before the age of 25, 26. Okay. Mathematicians are considered, when they get to 27, 28, and 30, they're going downhill. Oh. And Venus, Venus has its great year in the 25th year. Uh, Mars is the 28th year of life. Mercury is the 32nd year of life. Saturn is the 36th year of life. So if you have a Virgo or Gemini ascendant, the 32nd year is very, very important. Now, if, if you have the 32nd year of life, the Mercury ascendant, but Mercury is afflicted, okay. that year is going to be difficult. Okay. If you have the Jupiter ascendant, you have... Pisces or Sagittarius, the 16th year is the great year for Jupiter. Yes. If Jupiter is afflicted, that year will be terrible. Oh. Okay. So this is very, very separate, very, very different from, from uh, dashas and buktis and transits. This is how you miss things. Everything looks good, but the great year came of age. Rahu, <laughs> okay. Rahu, uh, Rahu is the uh, 42nd year of life between 41 and 42. People can be, Rahu is power, worldly power. People often between 41 and 42 and 42 onwards, they start to have power. Ketu is the 48th year between 47 and 48. People start to get psychic and intuitive. 47, 48. But these things, you use these 
along with the dashas and dukis, along with the transits, it may confirm something that's happening. Okay. Okay? Okay. Uh, another thing, um, you know, in the Hindu scriptures, there's a lot of exaggeration. Now, that's normal for India, and the Indians understand that, but Americans, they take it very, very literally, and it becomes a problem. It becomes okay. a problem. Um, one of the things that they say is that the waxing moon is benefic and the waning moon is malefic. This yeah. is not so. It's a question of how bright the moon is. Oh, okay. It's more how bright it is. It could be a day or two after the full moon. That's very bright. Yes. That's, much better, that's much better than a waxing moon that's yes, only two yes. or three days. Yes. Yeah. Uh, another thing is that they say in the texts, Rahu is like Mars. Uh, no. Saturn. Let's see. Mar Rahu is like Saturn and Ketu is like Mars. Yes. This is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. <laughs> Rahu, is only, Rahu is only like Saturn uh, because they're long in their dasha. And okay. Ketu and Mars are short in their dasha. Okay. But if you have a planet conjunct Rahu, and Rahu is a malefic, you have a, a planet conjunct Rahu, it gets a little bit of malefic energy, but it doesn't ruin it. It doesn't destroy it terribly. But if you have a planet conjunct Ketu, that planet is can be devastated. Okay. Mars and Saturn, those malefics, Mars and Saturn next to Ketu, sometimes they're okay, but many times they're not. But Venus with Ketu, Mercury with Ketu, Jupiter next to, if they're close, two, three, four, five degrees, they become very, very badly afflicted. Okay. I, would much, I would much prefer to have a planet conjunct Rahu rather than Ketu. Yeah, and if I would ask you a question here, uh, is there any reason that why the affliction is more serious on the side of Ketu? I mean, is, did you find any reason or that's like your observation or how is it? Rahu, well, it's my observation for okay. one thing. I have two planets conjunct Ketu. Okay. But here's the thing. Rahu symbolizes insatiable cravings and desires for power. Oh, okay. It's not going to hurt Venus or Jupiter or Mercury so badly. Ketu represents the other plane of existence. Okay. So if you have your ascendant ruler okay. or, the sun, or the sun or the moon conjunct Ketu, okay. it's like when you get born, you have one foot still in the spiritual world and one foot in the material world. And the, and the material world becomes stressful. Okay. Because, because the Ketu is making you introspective and sensitive. Okay. If the planet, if your ascendant ruler or sun, moon, Venus is next to Ketu, it makes you very psychic and intuitive. But dealing with the world is, I call Ketu pretty much like a black hole. Oh. If a planet is near Ketu, it's like it gets into a black hole and that planet cannot function properly. It's, if it's Venus with Ketu, the person is unconscious and has uncontrollable, unconscious experiences with love. If it's Mercury, they have unconscious, uncontrollable experiences with their mind. Oh. Now, now, Ketu becomes very strong by being with Venus or Jupiter or Mercury. Oh. So these, these people become very psychic and very spiritual. If you visit, like I used to go to different spiritual movements to do uh, astrology. Okay. When people were spending their lives at an ashram, many of these people had Ketu with Venus, Ketu with Jupiter, Ketu with Mercury. Oh. Ketu would be very strong. So they okay. were more interested in psychic metaphysical. Oh. Okay. But the Venus, the Jupiter, the Mercury would be harmed. Oh. But, Ketu, but Ketu would be strong. Um, another thing is, um, 